everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Erica Saar. I'm a primary therapist at Dental Path at the Meadows, and I'm here today to give my webinar talk on addiction interaction in young adults, drug, sex, and tech. So let's dive right in because I have tons of material, lots of things I'm really excited to talk to you guys about, and hopefully you find it useful for what's showing up in your practice. So uh, why am I talking to you? Well, I have training in biofeedback. I've been working in addiction in the residential setting for a number of years. Um, I also work a lot with technology. So I kind of have a, some expertise in some of these areas that hopefully you guys are going to find useful. Um, so moving right along here in my slides, if my technology will allow... Haha, ha, there we go. Excellent. So just quick disclosures, disclaimers. Like I said, I work for General Path at the Meadows, so um, I'm salaried by them, but I don't have a financial interest arrangement with other organizations that could be construed as a conflict of interest. So I'm not trying to really sell you anything. Um, any tech or sites or games or things that I reference here are not being suggested as problematic in and of themselves. We're talking about problematic use, not problematic content. So just to keep that in mind as we move along. So, so the objectives, we're going to talk about addiction interaction patterns because how these things interact is really important. We're going to talk about motivations that clients may have for both having their addictive behavior as well as continuing their addictive behavior. And we're going to talk about questions that you can use, particularly around querying technology use, because I found that that's the thing that most uh, clinicians are the least comfortable with. So the goal is to help you get more comfortable. All right, so let's just dive into addiction interaction. So this is the addiction interaction model by Patrick Carnes. If you work with the Recovery Start Kit or any of those materials, this will be really familiar to you. If you don't, don't worry about it. We're going to talk about it. So there are kind of a couple crucial pieces in this particular slide that I'm showing you guys. So that colored ring there in the center uh, is going to be your sort of pathways to addiction. So sort of, a, you know, what addictions uh, tap the arousal and pleasure pathways, the numbing pathways, deprivation, and dissociative fantasy. So it's just some examples of some things that you might see your young adults in particular using in each of these areas. If you're thinking about arousal, that's where you're going to see things like cocaine use, uh, stim other stimulants, caffeine, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, uh, pornography, and high-intensity video gaming. When we think about things like numbing, that's where you're going to see things like alcohol, marijuana. Um, in terms of technology, you'll see what we kind of call click numbing. So where you're just going from site to site, and that could be things like pornography, but it also could be things like shopping or just surfing the internet and suddenly hours are gone. Um, dissociation, we're looking for a separation from self. So that can be creating fake online identities for sexual purposes or otherwise. It can be sort of the deep fantasy immersion in massive multiplayer video games. Uh, it can be substances like hallucinogens and opiates. And then we think about deprivation. And so some people are like, well, how can you deprive yourself addictively? Uh, it can be part of a pattern. So for example, really high performing video game addicts will sometimes ignore even basic self-care unto the point of death. Um, and so it seems surprising, but that's actually true. Also things like social isolation, sleep deprivation, those kinds of parts can be part of a cycle. And then we want to look at, so those four gray quadrants, um, the top left uh, substances, you know, there's really no surprise there. Everybody's pretty familiar with those. There's a variety of substances that people can use to alter their mood. In the top right, we have processes. So things like food, sex and love, work, money, exercise. Really, uh, if you can do it, you can make it into an addiction and use it to alter your mood if you really want to. But these are some common ones that we'll see in our young folks. Maybe work a little less. That one tends to come along a little later, but you can see it in your college students if you have highly perfectionistic folks. So something to keep an eye on there. Then core affect states. Yes, we can be addicted to our emotions, particularly intense emotions like self-loathing, rage, shame, and uh, particularly in the era of technology, we've become addicted to instant gratification. And a lot of young folks really aren't 
um, being trained or wired to uh, expect delays, expect frustration, those kinds of things. And that can be a challenge for those who struggle with compulsivity and impulsivity. And lastly, in that other corner, we have relationships. And so folks can um, be codependent, they can be love addicted, and young adults, interestingly, might be especially prone to this. So if you think about uh, Helen Fisher, who's a fan fantastically brilliant evolutionary uh, anthropolo anthropologist, she talks about why we love, sort of the biological ramifications of why we fall in love and romance and all that fun stuff. And one of the things that gets talked about is that early phase of love, that sort of puppy love, has a Romeo and Juliet quality um, that young people, when they're experiencing their first heartbreaks and things like that, can believe that their love is the love of the ages. And everyone that's giving them feedback that you're going to get over this, you're going to get through this pain, you're going to have other loves, they don't believe that anybody really understands their pain because it's their first time experiencing it. Um, so they can be really prone to medicate in this, you know, in this time. Think about your, your teenagers or young adults who won't get out of bed when they're heartbroken, things like that. It can, in its, in its extreme forms, uh, devolve into behaviors like obsession, and stalking, self-medicating through substances, things like that. So if we're talking about addiction interaction, those are the things we're kind of be keeping an eye on. So I finally learned which way to turn the mouse. Hooray. So we're going to look at the specific kind of patterns uh, just really briefly because, again, I said I have lots of things I want to talk to you guys about. You have the list there up on the slides. Um, and to just talk about a few and how they might look while you're seeing a young adult in your office or if you're uh, watching this because you're worried about a loved one, these are some things to think about. So cross tolerance means early exposure to one addictive process or substance sets you up to sort of more quickly pick up another process or substance to an addictive level. level. So imagine things like early exposure to games or pornography um, might set up just kind of a pattern of kind of click numbing we talked about. And so if someone is uh, trying to be sober from pornography or video games, but they find themselves just sort of aimlessly searching the web, that's something to keep an eye on. Withdrawal mediation is I'm using one substance or process to not feel the withdrawal from others. So those who are in substance recovery uh, may um, fall into process behaviors like gaming or sex uh, because they're feeling the effects of not being able to use their drug, which is, you know, a natural, a natural desire to avoid pain, but we don't want them to start using what might not be a compulsive behavior in a compulsive way so that then they have to start curtailing that later in their life as well. Um, replacement is just switching. Um, so you have gotten rid of, you've gotten dry from one addiction and you've moved to another, pretty self-explanatory, and they like to move in all different directions. Uh, alternating cycles, you can have an isolating cycle where maybe somebody is really introverted and using their tech to just sort of be alone and maybe use alcohol and marijuana, but then they have a different phase where they finally want some attention or they want some human interaction, and so they may switch over to using their tech on hookup apps and things like that so that they can have a social part of their interaction, but maybe to get over their nerves there, they might switch to stimulants so they could be more sexually performative or things like that. So you look for cycles that might switch. Masking is when we use one addiction to hide the presence of another. Uh, so let's say somebody, uh, you think they're in the room video gaming a lot, but actually a good chunk of that time is spent soliciting people online or watching pornography. Is that inherently bad? No, but we want to look at patterns where uh, the behavior is becoming compulsive and detrimental in areas of people's lives. Um, numbing is, I'm just using all anything I can find, whether it's a substance or a process, to, to numb out my feelings. I can't handle feelings of pain, frustration, anger, that kind of stuff. Combining is when I combine multiple substances or processes together to get a more intense experience. So you might have things like uh, using sexual flirtation to enhance your gaming experience. Uh, combining alcohol and stimulants creates basically like almost an entirely different drug is what my addicts have described. And so they don't want to do one without the other. They're looking for that very specific 
combined experience, which also goes with ritualizing, which I skipped over, which is doing things in a very specific pattern to get a very specific emotional result. Disinhibiting is I might use substances um, like alcohol or marijuana to make myself more relaxed and feel more free to chat with people or expose myself online or things like that. Uh, and then fusion. Fusion is where two addiction interaction patterns have become fused. You don't want one without the other, and they if you do one, you're likely to trigger the other. Now, for our young adults, one place that this is going to be really challenging is the fusion of sex and meth. Now, lots of other things can fuse, but sex and meth particularly seem to like to fuse to each other. That has ramifications ramifications for like our young gay men who may want to be out having sex um, but that has been fused with drugs for so long that when they try to go out and have healthy normative appropriate fun creative sex with their partners they suddenly find that they're having a highly intense urge to use their drugs again so something really to keep an eye on as somebody is maybe in a later stage of recovery and wanting to move back into reincorporating some of their behaviors like their sexuality so we've talked a lot about tech because I think that's the piece, like I said, that people sometimes feel like they know the least about. So uh, tech is changing all the time. Um, I had just gotten that, that picture on the right there a couple days before I was supposed to give this webinar. And it really does talk about how um, ubiquitous that technology has become. You know, more and more we're finding that smartphones and other kinds of technology have pretty much, uh, we think in the 60 plus percent penetration of the, the market, meaning 60 plus percent of people in the United States at least have a smartphone or similar technology. So that's a lot of people. Um, but then thinking about necessity, um, more and more it's kind of become a requirement for people to have those things, both for school and for jobs, but also like a sense of social necessity. Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about kind of a couple places is FOMO. Uh, if you don't know that term, it's the fear of missing out. Uh, and a lot of uh, young people have a really intense fear that if they're not connected to their technology pretty much all the time, that there are, are things that are happening that they don't know about or they're not part of. And the answer to that is that is true. Our entire life that has been true. So right now, as you're watching this webinar, there are things both good and bad happening that you're not participating in. But prior to technology, we didn't know about all of those things happening. But right now, one could log on to say like Facebook and see a thousand things that are going on and you're getting, feeling this pressure to be involved in all of them. And you don't have enough hours in the day to do that. Um, we're looking at, you know, thinking about necessity um, we're, we're realizing that young folks consume between 11, it's right around 11 hours of media a day. And that number, um, this study is from about 2010. My guess is that number has probably gone up. And what happens is, is that we're actually consuming technology in multiple streams. So in a space of seven, you know, clock hours, a teenager could be consuming 11 to 14 hours of media because they're on their cell phone and on their computer and watching the TV uh, and on a gaming system kind of all at the same time. So they're being inundated with stimulus all the time. Um, one of the things that um, there was a study that Laporta did where they talked about fears around social technology and about how um, they were worried that it extends like the necessary teen narcissism. So teens naturally think they're the center of the universe, right? Uh, but we're talking about young adults and hopefully young adults should be sort of hopping over some of the hurdles into more sort of, you know, coherent adulthood. Um, but what technology, one of the things we want to think about with technology that it can do is it can erase some of those hurdles. So for example, uh, a rate, you know, blocking people. So you can break up with someone via text so that you don't have to see their pain or hurt, and then you can block them so you don't ever have to hear from them again. Uh, and that means that you don't have to learn how to negotiate relationships in the same way um, that my generation, generations before did. Now there's some debates about whether or not that's a bad thing if it becomes the new cultural norm okay, that might be a thing that all young adults can integrate. But right now we're in a transitional period where they can experience some pain 
uh, if they're not having all the skills that some people would expect of them. So I could spend literally my entire uh, webinar talking about the tech, but I want to move on um, uh, to my, those last two points so I make sure we have time to talk about some other things as well. So um, gamification is the idea of using game theory uh, and game building in order to get people to use your service or technology. So think about your cell phone, which I'm sure you have. You've probably looked at it a couple times while you've been watching this webinar. And think about like push notifications, those little like buttons that pop up on your front screen to let you know that a deal's available or you got a new email or you got a new text, those kinds of things. What's really interesting is there's a lot of companies that are using things, basic human learning theory to train us to use their products. So if you've ever thought about like a shopping app that rewards you more and more for every day you log in, so it's using positive reinforcement, right? But if you miss one day, you go back to the beginning of that queue. So you're, you're building reinforcement and you're also using punishment because really what they want is they want you logging in every day. It's that foot in the door technique of sales. Like I, if I can get you on my website, I have a chance you'll buy something or if I can get you on my app. Um, there are a couple really interesting books that if you're really into this that you might want to look into. Uh, Hooked by Naira Ayal. I'm sorry if I've butchered that name for like a thousandth time. And Irresistible by Adam Alter. Um, those are kind of two newer books that are out about these phenomena. And it's really kind of cool. And then the last point on here is techno stress, which is a term and phenomenon that I actually kind of uncovered while doing a bunch of research for this talk. And basically what techno stress is, is the stress that we develop about our need to be, to keep up with technology, to be in constant contact with our technology, the constant intrusiveness of our technology, or what happens if we step away from our technology. So it's like a catch 22. It's like everything about tech or being away from my tech stresses me out. Uh, and it's a really important phenomenon to look at. Um, so there were some things around, uh, Tomei et al. talked about techno stress where women, when they combined uh, mobile and computer use as well as looking at the number of text messages that they received, uh, found that online chatting increased depression and online surfing increased sleep disturbance. So that's kind of a well done. I imagine all of us have answered a text in the middle of the night and it's disrupted our sleep. But think about those who are more prone to addiction or more prone to depression, right? So the super healthy people we're probably not gonna see in our office, but somebody who already struggles with getting enough sleep to help them with their depression, and now they feel this intense pressure to be answering their text messages in the middle of the night and has more disrupted sleep is likely to be more depressed, right? Turns into a pretty vicious cycle. Um, for men, they found that phone calls and text messages increase sleep disturbance, and number of text messages received actually increased depression, which was really interesting. Uh, they didn't talk too much about why, but that was just something that they found. Um, and technology is also, again, there is that it can be used for a sense of immediate gratification for entertainment or to reduce stress. Um, but there's also a reduced sense of volitional control, and that's that compulsive part, right? When we get into addiction, it's not, oh, I'm very consciously using this piece of technology to manage my feelings. It's that I feel like I can't put this down or I can't let that message pass by or I have to know what's being talked about right now. So moving on, as much as I'd love to talk about this some more, just really quick, uh, because this is my, my most favorite thing to talk about, is more and more folks are, are worried about uh, video games and video game addiction. Now, you know, we can have a long discussion about all the wonderful, amazing things that video games can do for mental health, um, but if we're talking about folks that we're worried about addiction, some of the things that people look for when they're playing video games are things like power and sex and recognition, a sense of camaraderie, of belonging to community, especially if you don't have a local community you feel like you can belong to and escape. Now, these can be great. So let's say you're the only gay kid in your small town in Iowa, but you can find a large gay gaming community on World of Warcraft and they accept you for who you are. That's fantastic in one way. 
But if it's at a crucial period of time where you need to be learning developmental skills and say you intend on going to college uh, in a big city where there are going to be other gay people and you can finally belong to a face to face community. Um, but you're so nervous and you haven't practiced any of your social skills that even when you're in that big city, you still gravitate back to being online only that might have been a problem. Doesn't mean you have to give up your supportive online community, but it needs to be an addendum to real life interaction as well. Um, and I say that as an ardent gamer, I spend a lot of time online, so I'm not knocking online communities at all. Um, but I know from the research beyond just personal experience, particularly boys and men, do less well the more time they spend playing video games. If they get into like ultra gaming, which is 40 plus hours a week, um, they experience much more increased depression. For some reason, women experience that a little less, uh, probably because they do use the social aspects of gaming more. So we're gonna move on uh, to talk about sex. So one of the things that technology has done, if we're thinking about interaction, is technology has basically made sex 24 seven available to everyone in a variety of ways. So you've got your, your sexual hookup apps, like those are gonna be Tinder and Grindr. You've got sexting, which can be with your partner or thousands of partners. Um, there are selfies, which there's a whole body of literature around selfies. There's worries around our selfies, the expression of narcissism. Are they an artistic expression of self-love and self-acceptance? The answer is probably yes. It's all of those things depending on how people are using them. Uh, if people are struggling with maybe a pornography addiction, you've got a computer right in your pocket, ready to go, and it streams quick, and it has access to everything. You also have a webcam for either camming yourself, camming with others, or potentially, um, you know, if we're moving into compulsive or boundary violating behavior in the nature of somebody who might be a sex addict, um, using your phone to violate the boundaries of others. So for example, the, the surgeons of, you know, upskirting pornography and things like that. And the important thing to think about technology and sex addiction is that the future is now. Um, virtual reality technology is here. It's becoming more and more affordable. Expect that your young adults are going to know more about it than you do. Ask them about it. Um, probably for most young adults right now, it's going to be out of their, um, their affordability range, but be prepared that that's not going to be forever. Um, there's also going to be things like teledildonics, which is um, sex toys and, and, and robots and things that can be interacted with via the internet. So what you see on the screen of a woman in acting out is what the machine will do to you. Uh, so imagine if you have a young adult who's really struggling with fitting in socially and things like that, how, how seductive that's going to appear to them as opposed to stretching themselves to be in social interaction with others. So sex addiction, so, you know, sex is not bad. We want people to be having, you know, good, creative, fun, playful sex, but think about when sex is becoming compulsive or any behavior is becoming compulsive. I no longer feel like I have control over it. Um, I no longer feel like I, it's enjoyable. Instead, it's something I have to do. And so if you don't like the term sex addiction, you know, think about compulsive behavior. Um, but things you might want to think about that makes the addiction model really useful is consider the pieces of addiction. So are you seeing increased tolerance? So are you seeing people whose sexual behaviors are becoming more and more intense um, because they uh, vanilla pornography doesn't do it for them anymore because they've watched hours and hours of it every day. And so they're, they're finding that they have to watch pornography that, you know, six months ago they would have considered deviant or outside their sexual template or they find disturbing to watch, but at least that disturbance is part of arousal for them. Do they experience withdrawal when they can't be in contact with their, their sexual behavior uh, or their technology. There was a study, I think it was in, from Virginia, uh, where they gave young adults an option of sitting in a room alone with nothing to do for an hour or receiving an electric shock. Uh, and something like 50% of the men, at least, I'm going to get those numbers wrong, but it was, it was an alarming percentage, said, shock me. Uh, I can't, uh, I don't want to be <laughs> sitting still for that long. 
Uh, we talked about, you know, inability to control your behavior. So are you watching porn or engaging in sexual uh, texting or, or video camming at inappropriate places or inappropriate times? Your young adults, is it costing them work? You know, are they being fired because they can't stop being sexual at times when they're supposed to be doing other things? Uh, and then there's um, health problems. So one of the things that's sort of, um, you know, being looked at right now is a phenomenon called porn-induced erectile dysfunction, where uh, these guys don't have anything medically wrong with them. It's just they've overstimulated themselves to the point where um, they're no longer able to get erections and be sexually functional with uh, willing partners. And it's really distressing for both them and their partner. Um, so one of the things that's important to know, if you're somebody who's worked in sex addiction for a long time, you probably know this, but if you're somebody who's like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this, is that our younger folks who have this porn and tech addiction can tend to have a slightly different sort of family profile than our classic, what you might've heard about classic kind of sex addict folks who had a certain sort of rigid disengaged family system that sort of set them up for a sexual addiction, seeking love, seeking affirmation, things like that. The porn guys might have a different experience because pornography is a radically different experience than face-to-face -face sex. So just something to keep in mind. We're gonna talk about assessment here in a minute, but one thing that's really important, if you're not somebody who primarily works in a sexuality field is getting really comfortable asking a ton of questions to young people about sex. And I mean a ton um, because there are certain things they're not going to tell you unless you ask. And there are certain things you're not going to know to ask, but you got to be really comfortable talking about pornography, masturbation, uh, hookup apps, casual sex, um, one night stands, those kinds of things. And trying to do that without, um, really projecting that you're not going to have a sense of judgment about that because young people are really, really sensitive towards like, you're going to tell me that what I'm doing isn't cool and I should be waiting for marriage and those kinds of things. And so I'm going to kind of lie to you about, you know, what my deal is, particularly if you're like me and you're kind of getting to be an older clinician. They're like, oh, this is like talking about sex with my mom. And you're like, well, thank goodness I'm not your mom, right? Um, so let's move on. Um, here's the, uh, here, speaking to that point, not every sexual behavior that a young person shows up with is going to be compulsive. So we get sometimes young folks whose parents, you know, they're sort of parent referred and they're like, my kid's sexuality is all messed up. Um, and when we get them, it's a pretty rare case because we have a good screening process here, but on an outpatient basis, you're likely to see this more uh, where they have parental or cultural or personal norms about what uh, is healthy sexuality. Um, so, oh, they're having premarital sex. They must be a sex addict. Not necessarily. They might just be 20. Um, or they're having gay sex, and that's against our religion. I'm not here to tell anybody what their religion should or should not believe. I will tell you that sex, uh, sexual addiction therapists, we do, we do not do conversion therapy. Nobody should be doing conversion therapy. It's illegal, it's unethical, and it doesn't work. Um, so sometimes people show up trying to have us do that, and we just kind of have to gently talk to them about something that we're not going to do. Um, it could be age normative exploratory behavior. They could have looked at porn uh, as long as it's not illegal and boundary violating, say, involving children. Um, you know, if they watch something with like bestiality and it freaked them out and they never watched it again, but they ran in here and be like, oh my God, I must be a sex addict. I mean, talk to them about, you know, young adulthood and teenagers. We explore. Uh, people can have a lack of appropriate sex education. Uh, so for example, somebody on uh, the autism spectrum may just need a little bit more education about what is appropriate sexuality uh, um, to help them rein in what might be looking compulsive or impulsive. Uh, there's increasing gender and sexual fluidity that uh, clinicians, especially again, old guard clinicians need to get more on board with. So someone who might enjoy wearing makeup or dresses, may not be cross-dressing in the old school traditional sense of, I think I'm supposed to be a woman, or uh, I put on these women's clothes because it gives me sexual arousal. They could just be, I'm a man, I know I'm a man, and I also enjoy wearing skirts. Cool. Um, 
that's a different issue. That's not a compulsivity issue. Uh, is the addiction to the tech or the sex? It's so funny because I just uh, just came back from a training with Rob Weiss, who's absolutely brilliant and lectures on technology and sex. And he's like, well, how can people get addicted to technology? It's just glass and plastic. And I was like, fair. I'm not saying people are actually addicted to that box any more than he gave the example of people aren't addicted to the glass bottle the beer came in. But tech is a holder of we talked about all that gamification and we talked about all those pathways to everything else that you want. But there's also like that numbing that's in the clicking, in the searching, in the scrolling. And there may be a compulsive soothing component to those behaviors that may or may not be connected to the end result. So it's just kind of an interesting thing that some researchers are looking at. And then we could have somebody present with paraphilic sexual behavior, which isn't necessarily a sex addiction. You can have sex addicts that are also paraphilic, which means having fetishized behavior, but some people have just have fetishes and they may have distress around that and they may need to have work around that and that's fine, but we may not be looking at an addiction. And if we're talking about addiction interaction, so somebody who has say a foot or a shoe fetish and they're drinking a lot because they're so ashamed of their fetish has potentially an addiction to their alcohol and has shame around their sexual fetish, but may not have a cross addiction of a fetish and alcohol. So, one really important thing for young people is that they have a really high potential to end up in legal trouble due to patterns that have just been naturally carried over from their child and teen years, i.e. when they started looking, because they had the internet when other people didn't. And so when they were 12, they might have started Googling 12-year-old girls and seen child pornography when they were children and gotten that encoded in their template. So when they're young adults, they're still looking for things that are illegal. Now, does that mean that that is in their template forever and they're primary pedophiles and that's a huge problem? Maybe. Maybe not. We want to look for flexibility in their template. We want to look for non-exclusivity. However, you want to be really aware that this is a thing that can come up. You want to be aware of your state's guidelines, your professional licensure guidelines. What are your mandated reporting requirements? So for example, currently in California and Pennsylvania, uh, non-identified child pornography victims. So if somebody just comes in and says, I'm watching child pornography um, that I downloaded off the internet, in those states, there's reporting requirements around that now that other states don't have, unless somebody was saying, I've been taking and watching videos of my sister, who's an identifiable person. Um, so you really want to know what your responsibilities are going to be, be really clear with parents and young adults about what the expectations will be and what steps have to be taken. If someone is doing this compulsively, uh, this may be outside your scope of practice. This may be somebody who ends up needing to be in offender-based treatment uh, or because of their legal situation may be mandated to offender-based treatment. Now, hopefully, if they also have co-occurring addictions, you can get on a team where some people are working with the offending behaviors. You're also on a team working with the compulsive parts of the behaviors, and you guys can have a really solid collaborative experience because that's going to set that young up, adult up for the most set for the most success. One other quick challenge just on this point is that young adults, it used to be that uh, people who had uh, been designated as offenders didn't have access to their technology anymore. But judges and everybody are no noting that young adults need their computers to go to school or to have jobs and things like that. And so those um, restrictions have sometimes become more flexible, which is fantastic for building positive supports for young people, but it also opens up that door for them to have access to things that might be problematic for them. So this is the part that, uh, that I feel like people know the most about, so we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but some important things to know about substance use and young people. A lot of the stats that I'm gonna mention here, I pulled off from the National Institute for Drug Abuse. They have lots of good resources, um, things that you guys can check out. Uh, social factors for young adults are really important. So we're not just talking about addiction in everybody, but think about young adults. So social factors like belonging to LGBTQ, college attendance, um, their socioeconomic status, their locality may affect drugs of choice or opportunity. So for example, I used to work in Philadelphia and heroin was the big deal there, uh, particularly because people had slid down from Oxycontin and Oxycodone. 
but in other cities and other towns, it's going to be more alcohol or it's going to be more the party or club drugs. So really knowing kind of what kids have access to and what's considered cool. I keep saying kids, but young adults, you know, um, and what they're going to sort of seek out based on their sort of, you know, social makeup. Uh, another important thing that I've learned uh, here working with my young adults is they're often savvy about uh, substances that I've never heard of um, that can't be screened for, particularly the created drugs. So a lot of the club drugs and things the the manufacturers make a, a drug that's one isomer off from the one that was just declared illegal and now it's legal again. They also experiment a lot with the drugs that you can get in the various like head shops and things, you know, bath salts was in that category for a while until we realized how very dangerous they are. Um, things like salvia and spice and those kinds of things until they become illegal. Um, but some interesting stats from a uh, 2014 college survey, they found in the last 20 years daily marijuana use has tripled. Um, college students are reporting higher incidences of intoxication and binge drinking uh, during the, in that study over 35 percent percent reporting uh, having been drunk in the last two weeks uh, cigarette use is more common in non-college students um, and this is one that kind of scared me uh, stimulant abuse is dropping in full-time college students hooray because there used to be that whole like Ritalin stimulant abuse but cocaine use is on the rise so boo Nobody wants that. Um, the other thing that's really, two things about young adults that I wanted to mention is that there's a study by Aria et al. that found that consistent energy drink use, so again, Monster, Red Bull, that kind of stuff, was correlated to later higher rates of stimulant abuse. So things that they're doing that are legal are setting them up. They're building those neural pathways to set them up to maybe move into illegal behavior or more dangerous behavior later on. And the other thing that was really concerning was um, that, uh, that, they're, that they're finding um, more risky, there's more acceptance of substance use. There's more, and there's more acceptance of not just like drinking, but more acceptance of broad substance use. And in, the one that was particularly concerning was they were like, oh no, um, declines of perception of harm done by substance use, including uh, prescription stimulant abuse, ecstasy, crack, and bath salts. I don't know about you, but I have never met anyone whose life was improved by the use of crack or bath salts. So I really don't know kind of how they're perceiving those as non-harmful. And that's really concerning because that means they're more likely to experiment. And we know with some of those drugs, they can have incredibly detrimental effects with even single usage. So I know we're getting close to running out of time here, but let's talk, so it's not just like, wow, isn't this awful? Don't young adults have it really bad? So let's talk about how you guys can help. So there's, there's a couple phases here. We wanna look at a good, clear assessment. We wanna look at underlying etiology intervention, addictive process intervention, building social systems, and then thinking about the future because young adults have a lot of future left to think about. So thinking about assessment. So for um, lots of letters up there, you can look them up. The first two, the, the SAS and the SDI are assessments for sex addiction. Um, and they can really help you get kind of comfortable with uh, if you kind of struggle over asking questions outright. Um, you can have people do the assessment and then have a chance to kind of take a look at it. But I highly encourage you to get really comfortable saying the word masturbation saying the word pornography and asking about what kind of porn do you watch. Um, it's just going to be a thing that's going to have to happen if you're not comfortable with it. Uh, the IAT is the Internet Addiction Test. Um, Olganon, which is Online Gamers Anonymous, also has some questionnaires on their website to look at compulsive internet use, compulsive video game use. That's a newer area, so there are sort of fewer um, fewer uh, assessments out there, but don't be afraid to try and or just ask lots of questions. Again, um, on the National Institute for, for Drug Abuse website, there are tons of screeners for substance abuse. The SASE, excuse me, the SASE is just one uh, screener that's good, but there are ones from everything to four question screeners to really long comprehensive interviews that might um, like the gain that might, um, if you want lots and lots of detail about somebody's life. But again, I go back, 
to, it used to be like, let's do a biosocial interview. It's like, no, now it's like a biosocial, sexual, technical interview. It's getting longer and longer, but you get so much information. Don't be afraid not to know. If somebody says, I'm really into this, be like, I don't know what that is. I'm a gamer. People are like, oh, I'm really into such and such a game. I'm like, oh, I don't play that one. Tell me a little bit about it. And then I'll go look up some more about it if I think it's going to be relevant. And I put on there the magic question. Um, this shouldn't work, but it does. And so I'm going to share it with you guys. Uh, something that I do is I just ask people, what is the question I haven't asked you yet that you're hoping I don't ask you? Um, and so we really kind of, and oftentimes they'll answer it. So yay, information I never would have thought to ask. This slide, which I know um, you can pause your computer and take a longer look at, is a list of questions that, um, that I developed around uh, potential compulsive video game uses. And this is often, the, I pulled some uh, pieces off of the internet addiction test and some things, but I really frame this around uh, cross addiction and video games. And so you can ask some things here. If you're worried about somebody who compulsively, that somebody who might be compulsively gaming, or you can use aspects. So that question that says, tell me about your avatar or favorite character, you can use some of the um, projective aspects of video gaming to explore what is it they're trying to get out of this experience and is it fine the way they're doing it or do you need to use that to build something into their real life um, so if someone is just sort of wanting to numb out so we're talking about um, sort of the underlying etiology stuff here and this is stuff I know you guys know this, so we're not going to spend too much time on this, but you might want a good psychiatric evaluation, might need medication intervention if people are numbing out their anxiety or, or their depression. You want to have good trauma work. If they have a classic addiction profile, they probably have some trauma that needs to be resolved in order for the addiction to resolve. Improving social competency so young adults who struggle with being a functional adults need a little bit of help. Um, overcoming their fears. Like I said, addressing anxiety, depression, any other underlying psychological or psychiatric issues, and then managing and validating life stressors. It's hard to be a young adult. And I think a lot of times people are like, oh, you don't have all the bills, or you don't have kids, or you don't have this, or you don't have that. But we don't have a clear picture of what it is to be an adult in the United States. And so people are in this really weird place of, do I go to college? Don't I go to college? Do I get married? Don't I get married? Do I stay with my high school girlfriend? Do we break up? Do we like put it on hold? Um, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't know if I'm going to pass my exams. Oh my God, I'm having sex for the first time. It's a lot. So just validate that it's hard and you want to help them through it. Treating the addiction, there are multiple layers of treatment depending on how severe the addiction. Now, if we're talking about tech addiction, there are very few places to send people. Uh, if you're talking about sex addiction, there's a few more, um, but not as many uh, as you have for substance abuse. Substance abuse, you're going to have pretty good options as long as you have resources. Targeting, maintaining factors. So things like uh, with video gaming, if you're playing the herd away and things like that, uh, and and using virtual reality technology just really briefly uh, is something that um, more and more mental health practitioners are doing in order to treat trauma um, and also to, to engage in some desensitization. So something to think about. Developing safety and sobriety plans because we need some barriers in place around how I'm going to stay away from drugs or porn or video games or how much video games or how much porn or how much masturbation is okay. Young adults can fight you like the devil on the 12 step stuff. Some of them will need it. Some of them won't. Um, just be really clear. If you have an addiction, that could be a really useful thing for them. And if you can find a group of young adults who are in 12 step, that will be really helpful. And then motivational interviewing, because a lot of young adults are like, I'm 20. You're telling me you want me to give up alcohol for the rest of my life. No. So just be, be really good about brushing up motivational interviewing skills. Consider social influences. Some can help, some can hinder. Who developmentally, who's really going to influence this person? Are they really peer centric or are they kind of young for their age and their parents are going to be able to help? Or do they have a sober sibling or a sibling that they look up to? And again, support growing those social competencies because young adults, just like teenagers, are going to be much more influenced by social supports and sort of internal stuff. Is sobriety forever? Um, that's usually a huge question. You mean forever, ever? Substances, maybe. Like I said, nobody needs bath salts, not ever. Processes, probably not. We want you to have a fun, enjoyable life, 
Uh, it depends. If we're talking about illegal behavior like child pornography, yes, forever. But if we're talking about things like masturbation, probably not, unless it's severely against one's cultural values and things like that. What's important to tell them is sobriety, what is sobriety now can change. It's about redefining your relationship with your, your sexuality, your technology. So like, for example, like Reboot Nation and NoFap are a couple organizations around the porn induced erectile dysfunction. And they don't tell people like, no more porn forever. They're like, hey, let's stop doing using pornography until your penis starts working again. And then hopefully, um, we can talk about what will be healthy integration when you have the sex life that you want. In case this all felt easy, uh, there's lots of other factors to consider. We talked about the fear of missing out, that pressure to be doing things all the time. Young adults are often what I call you know, parent mandated, so somebody else is who's pushing them into treatment. So you're gonna have to use that motivational interviewing to get through those stages of change. Young adults have limited external resources. So it's unless they have a parent or a trust fund or things like that, they usually haven't built up their own money to be able to do the things that they might want to do. Uh, young adults also have age appropriate narcissism and think that nothing bad's gonna happen to them. And so they might be more resistant to understanding the effects of the choices they're making. Um, worrying about, oh, the can my friends come too was just about all the other cross addictions that we haven't had a chance to talk about that like to travel with this group, like hoarding and eating disorders and shoplifting and all kinds of things that you might see in your office. And then there's all kinds of subcultural beliefs. So all kinds of diversity things to consider, like our LGBTQ folks, young adults who have to be more adults because they're in the armed services and the cultural pressures of being a soldier uh, when you're 18. Non-US youth have different expectations around technology and values and things like that. SES values, uh, uh, change radically depending on if you have money for cocaine uh, and Oxycontin or are you doing heroin and crack because that's what's affordable not because you're you know less you know sophisticated of a person our spectrum disorder folks are going to struggle with understanding values and boundaries um, and the interpersonal interactions around sex that might look compulsive but really won't be and then we also have to consider people with developmental delay who might struggle with things uh, not understanding why they can't play 20 hours of video games or not understanding why exposing themselves is bad um, because they haven't been taught. They just need some, usually some education and usually firmer sort of directive boundaries because they're just not capable of doing that for themselves. So I know that was a ton of information. I'm super excited about this topic. I hope you learned something new. Um, there's no CEU for this video version of the webinar, so uh, don't ask. Uh, but the webinar at gentlepathmeadows.com uh, is if you have questions about the content, uh, some way that I could help you, you know, I'm certainly open to those kinds of things. I hope this was really informative and helpful for you. Thanks so much for spending your time with me and look forward to talking with you again next time.